there was a certain amount of unfairness, wasn't there, about the reception that the that the festival was given, particularly, I think, in the last uh, in the last four or five years. I think so. I, I think when Stratford came on, um, I'm not saying that there was necessarily um, uh, an undermining campaign, but I would think there would be some natural undermining that would come from the Stratford camp. Uh, I, th I think they saw the festival as, as, a, as a competitor. I think that they would be very pleased if um, the uh, festival were expunged from the historical record, um, leaving space for Stratford to say they were the first. And popped up ex nihilo, as it were. That's right. Yeah. So I think that the, the festival acted a bit as an irritant to, to that um, uh, opinion of themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that did play in, in a certain undermining. Um, uh, Herbert Whitaker was a, um, uh, quite a spotty type of, of critic. I, I think in the early days he seemed to be quite supportive of the festival, but he changed his tone later on which seems to me to be wrong because, if anything, the, the professional quality of the plays went up in all respects uh, toward, towards the end. Um, so you'd expect him to, to be the reverse, but he wasn't. And I, and I think that uh, it was largely because he favored Stratford. And, but I, I could never understand why he would want to compare the two. And in fact, on one, in one article, which I, I read from, from your work, uh, mm -hmm. uh, he said that it's in bad taste to compare Stratford with the Earl Grey players. And then he went on in his article to do precisely that. <laughs> <laughs> to what extent do you feel that the festival came to be taken somewhat for granted within Toronto? Oh, maybe there'd be an element of that because it going on for what ten or twelve years or or something was sort of a fixture um, every july and august you'd you'd have the the festival yes, maybe there would be an element of that yeah because uh one gets the impression uh in any case that um, once the Stratford festival had gotten underway and had begun to uh, generate the same sort of enthusiasm which I think the Earl Grey Festival also generated in its mm. early days. Yeah. Uh, there was a certain um, amount of indifference that um, uh, exposed itself in the reception to the festival uh, in Toronto. Yeah, because I think it would have been compared to Stratford. I mean, Stratford was bigger, it was more razzmatazz, uh, uh, they, they had expensive sets, they had a um, a world famous um, set designer and Tanya Mosevich yeah. was was promoted they they had the uh, the star concept um, uh, promoting stars uh, and it was um, it was not I wouldn't say it was like Hollywood but it was sort of that razzmatazz type of approach which um, works uh, it was a commercial theater in other words uh, whereas whereas uh, my parents the theater was not meant to be that way uh, they didn't they didn't promote the star concept. Uh, um, I, 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 they didn't, I think, see themselves as the star. They, they saw themselves playing legal, uh, leading roles uh, in a rather egalitarian um, company. In and fact, it was an egalitarian company. They, they didn't promote stars. But, and they didn't uh, have a commercial attitude toward it. Father kept saying he didn't want to make a profit. But, but uh, the subtext is that he didn't want to, to, to go through all the, the mechanisms that you need to go through to, uh, to have a commercial theater. You know, go out and raise money, get business involved, get governments uh, backing it, uh, uh, pay publicists to get out there and promote, uh, have stars, uh, have celebrities, all these things that go into the commercial theater. He was opposed to it. He just wanted a, a much simpler approach where, where um, you know, they'd, they'd make enough surplus so that everybody could have a, um, a dignified life, but not a rich one, uh, and, and have the plays um, uh, delight people. Now, he, uh, I'd just like to make the, the point um, mm -hmm. uh, that I think all the way through, uh, and, and one of the reasons I think that, that it was so successful, maybe the principal one, uh, was that there was a, there was a um, to paraphrase uh, Henry V, there was a little touch of magic in the night. Uh, and there really was. I, I remember it so distinctly. It's one of the most uh, 
enjoyable periods of my life in a, in, in a way. Uh, those those plays. I mean, I happen to be acting in them, but I know from talking to the uh, the um, uh, the audience, the people in the audience, they say the same thing. There was there was magic in that in that night. It uh, it was very beautiful to to watch. Simple, admittedly, and not all tricked up or anything. I'm talking about the scenery now, and the costumes. They were they were straightforward, simple things. There there was no. Uh, uh, innovation uh, or brilliance in them, but they were really, it was a nice visual look. Um, uh, the acting, I think, was professional. Uh, the lines, of course, were magnificent. They come from Shakespeare. Um, uh, the music was well chosen, um, I think particularly on, on three events that I can, I can think of. Uh, uh, in The Tempest, um, we always had uh, uh, Ralph von, von Williams' theme on Talus, uh, which is magnificent, haunting, mysterious type of music. And that was um, uh, yeah, for The Tempest, which is obviously uh, appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, then in Julius Caesar, we had Respighi's um, Pines of Rome, which is a type of march, and uh, all, the, all the senators would come out uh, with Julius Caesar at the end uh, uh, in slow motion, marching through uh, to the Pines of, of Rome, which, as you know, moves up to a, a crescendo at, at the end, and that's when Caesar appears. So it really worked beautifully. And, and then um, we had Prokofiev's Isle of the Dead and Much Ado About Nothing, where, where, where Claudia mourns uh, hero. And, um, uh, and that, <clears throat> that was um, a very sad, haunting piece of music. So uh, those three in particular, I, I remember, as being um, uh, special. So, they, so you had the music, you had uh, you know, the visual appearance, you had the sun going down and the, the evening coming on, the stars coming out, and you know, these beautiful lines well said. So it was, a, it was a touch of magic, there's just no doubt about that. Uh, and people remembered it, they, they talked about it, and they loved it. To what extent would you say that <clears throat> magic was connected with a sense of authenticity, that there was, uh, um, uh, that the contrast with Stratford, for example, with the commerciality of Stratford, um, might uh, well be characterized in terms of a more authentically Shakespearean experience? Well, I mean, it was certainly uh, uh, authentic. Uh, the Trinity productions were, were authentic. I, 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 I've seen Stratford productions, uh, quite a few of them. Uh, I wouldn't accuse them of lack of authenticity. I, I think they are pretty authentic, but uh, they, they were different. They were, um, I think that, that uh, there might have been some element of, of um, reconstruction of Shakespeare in some of them, which I would claim as inauthentic. Uh, uh, some element of the director um, you know, had some psychological twist to a, a character. Uh, often it would be a modern one. I mean, feminism can come in into it and that sort of stuff uh, uh, from time to time. Um, uh, but apart from that, I, I think they're pretty authentic. But certainly um, the festival's characters, uh, the fe the festival's plays were totally authentic. And, and, they, and they use traditional business as well. Uh, there's quite a lot of attention uh, paid by my father to business. And I'm thinking of one scene in particular and Twelfth Night, where um, uh, Sir Andrew Aguecheek and Sir Toby Belch are, are drunk uh, together. They've been drinking for quite some time, and, and they're, they're completely pissed. And, and uh, <laughs> they, <laughs> they, they have a, a big beer mug. They're drinking, well, I think it's a stoop of wine, so it's probably wine. But anyway, a big mug, a big thing about this big with a handle on it. And, and they start from uh, either end of the stage. And they'd, they'd try to have a toast where they'd not, uh, bang their, uh, their, their mugs and, and they'd miss each other. <laughs> and then they'd turn around again and have another go and they'd keep missing each other, which is, a very, is riotously funny when, when properly acted. And, and um, I, I haven't seen that in, in other productions of, uh, of Twelfth Night. It seems to be some business that, that either father invented or it's, it's, um, it's an old business that died out. I would like to ask you about uh, some of the memorabilia mm -hmm. that, um, uh, that were contributed to the festival that sort of testified a little bit to uh, the authenticity of its relationships with, um, 
uh, Shakespearean institutions in the old country. I'm thinking of the uh, shoe buckles worn by Martin Harvey when he played David Garrick, the mm -hmm. um, Henry Irving gloves that he wore as Benedict, which I believe your father also wore uh, when he played, I think it was, I think perhaps it was Benedict. Um, the snuff box used by Fred Terry in the Scarlet Pimpernel uh, and the amulet worn by Henry Irving as Shylock. Mm. What's your uh, recollection of how those came to be in the festival's collection? I can't. I, I don't. I uh, often wondered. I can't remember. I, I, I know they, uh, they did have some communication in London uh, with somebody, but, but uh, um, well, short answer is I don't remember okay. how they came up. But I know they were considered to be very important. They were terribly excited uh, when they got these artifacts. Well, as I, as I understand it, uh, they, uh, they were procured largely through uh, connections that your mother had actively generated. That she had it could well have been because if she was the outgoing side of the partnership, um, right. she'd be more likely to do it than he. He very, was very uh, shy in retiring. Um, the mulberry tree. Yes. <laughs> that, uh, that came from Stratford-on-Avon yeah. and uh, was eventually uh, um, a root of which was planted at first in Trinity College and then um, uh, a cutting uh, from which was planted in Stratford, hmm. Ontario, where it uh, continues to thrive. Um, do you recall anything about uh, that story? Yeah, there was a connection, I think, around about the time that these artifacts were, were obtained. Uh, uh, a correspondence with Stratford in, in England, and, and uh, uh, which resulted in, in the cutting coming out to to Trinity, and, and then there was a planting and plaque and all the rest of it. But, but it's, it's, it's disappeared, as you know. Um, yeah, unhappily. Um, the uh, portraits of your parents. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Well, there's an artist called Fred Challoner, who was very ancient at the time. I think he was in his 80s. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, whom mother organized to uh, to paint uh, these portraits. Uh, I mean, it must bear in mind that one of the, the the central and, in my opinion, one of the most interesting elements of of this whole history is uh, the fact that that my parents never had any money. They could never buy anything virtually uh, except the basics. Uh, and and she managed to persuade him to to do this portrait for free. Really? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Or these, there were two of them. Yeah. Uh, when about did that happen? Uh, within a few years of the end, I think, um, uh, maybe five years of uh, before mm. the end of the festival. Okay, so it was while the festival was at its oh yeah was at, at its, its height. peak yeah yeah, yeah. and and, um, and Challoner was was sympathetic to what they were doing and mother was quite persuasive when she mm -hmm. when she was on the ball. Uh, uh, did the uh, did the portraits then, um, uh, as you're saying, he was sympathetic to their to their sort of their goals, their aims. Mm. Did he, the, were the portraits then seen as sort of mm. being in the tradition of theatrical portraits, um, uh, of preserving some record of famous artists in their roles? Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. I, I, because I, as you know, these these are portraits of of the of those two in costume uh, playing roles, mm -hmm. Portia and Shylock. Mm -hmm. Yes. 